<laughs> but who would buy the, the Viper? The Viper. Stefan took my kid in the, for a drive. Stefan Asayo from Love and Chew took my kid for a drive in the Viper at a wine dinner here one night. And then came back and they snapped the key off in the ignition. <laughs> It's the That's how keen they were to get out. Oh, it. don't worry, man. It's, I'm telling you. It's really fast. <laughs> the Stefan's been the... I would like to be in and around when you, right have, uh, when you have Stefan here at this lovely... <laughs> and I, I will follow, as I always do, every conversation or in every one. He's the, he, he has these perfect, fantastic lines about wine that he throws out there. And afterwards, I just he always is. like to say, and his hair was perfect. His hair is perfect. <laughs> exactly. He, he cuts it once a year. He but cuts from a pair of old bastards, it doesn't have to be much to be perfect. He oh, has man. hair. No, dude, he's got Tom Cruise hair. It's he one does. of those heads of hair that just it, it looks perfect all the time. And a French accent. Yeah, without a doubt, man. If I'd known the accent would be so powerful with the girls, I would have come here earlier. He said to me once. <laughs> well, that's how we got Beatrice. <laughs> like, really? Beatrice is a hottie. Yeah, she's she is. fabulous, man. But he's, for me, he's our, he's... He's our best. He's our most yes, most capable, shall I say. I mean, I think, and it's another one of my pet peeves is the, the shackling of our winemakers by scores, is that if, if you were to set him free to do what he pleased and scores were not an issue, there'd be a different, and you too, I suspect, for a, to a degree, and all of us to a degree. There's anyone that says they're completely un, oblivious to that is, is probably not telling the truth, but... If you cut someone like Stefan free of any of that and say, okay, just go make what the hell you want, and every wine you make is automatically a 98 pointer, he would be making some really curious stuff, I suspect, yeah, yeah. by now. There's, there's, there's a problem. I mean, when I started out, I was not into there's the press. Lots of problems. And we did not submit samples to anybody. Imagine that. Right? And, and then Billy joined the company, you know. Right. Uh, Shannon My joined fabulous our company. partner, Billy, who was the great sales guy. And he. Uh, that was politically. Well, well he, phrased, I'd say. He, <laughs> great. You're gonna edit that one out. Make my life difficult. Am I? Um, no, but Billy, Billy waited until I went to. He, he was like, "Yeah, man, we got a tasting in Flo or in Hawaii. You gotta go." I was like, "Yeah, damn straight, I'm going." I wasn't even up the driveway, and he had the box packed, and he drove it up to the Spectator and dropped them all off. And a boy. And we got, you know, it, the great nightmare about the Spectator is that you're either gonna, they can either sink you or make you. You know, they can't sink you. They can only make you. You know, and uh, well, that's what I think people have discovered. But there was a huge fear in the beginning. You know, and Billy was Billy did a lot for for Paso and helping blow all up that. He got a lot of people to submit to the Spectator once, once that we got some good press and it really helped us as a company. But it's a double edged sword. You know, I mean, like all of a sudden everybody so it be said that the was trying to cherry was pick us for your yacht. Sorry, didn't you? To some you percentage, you could say you could say they supplies the virgins. I mean. But that was just <laughs> that was just part of the deal. So the virgins are on the yacht now. <laughs> you got to do something with them after harvest, dude. Yeah, otherwise, they go away. All right. um, no, but uh, quite honestly, you know, it it it's good for business. Are there it other sucks, industries that are? It sucks that it's defining us. And so here's the problem, and this is what I really want to challenge it's you with. Not defining us. You're right. This is this is what I want to get you into right now Speaking for a conversation, though. But it's like, you know, I've recently spent a lot of time out on the road. And you know we all know about the status of the economy and the madness of, of the whole <clears throat> game that is the wine business. But you know there's this huge consolidation of distributors. There is unbelievable downward pressure in the marketplace for wine and to sell wine. Plus, you know you got to make room with the three tier system for the distributor and the wholesaler. So how can you possibly make and drive and go crazy and pay the price for the killer killer fruit? Use the good barrels. Use it. You know. Really deliver what your passion and your artistic, you know, prowess wants to deliver when the industry or the machine that drives sales doesn't really want it anymore. And and what I'm seeing is like, you know, the way the, the business in America is going, and everything being gentrified or or commodity. The word I was using is commoditization. I guess it's like everything is is, is that falling to that. That um, where is the artisan winemaker going to go? I mean, like, yeah, I've I've done some some broad market wines, but my passion's in the funk and, and the really cool stuff that you yeah, and I do. But I think that I think how do we find the, our audience? I think that ultimately, the press is has certainly run with what we've got going. But if you look, the interesting thing to me and the way trends go and the way to see where trends are going, or if you look 
in the cellars when you go visit someone and they're doing, hey, you know, I got this Syrah that I picked, this 12.5%, this 13%, that's what I'm seeing right now, is everyone's trying to pick and everyone's gonna go too low a little bit and it's gonna be a bit green probably, but that trend is moving. And yeah, the whole press thing will take, and the sommeliers are behind all that, Right, but that, they don't. Wood, they don't have enough. Ripe. Well, they don't have enough influence. But I gave a ninety-eight point wine. Let's look this in big, thick, gooey thing. Let's <laughs> look in ten years, and the press will be perhaps marking those wines higher because the power of the sommelier and and you and other winemakers that are are pushing the envelope and going, okay, we've done this overripe thing, and it it was good, and it was easy, and we made bank, and but that's not really what I drink. You go to the meetings. I had a friend who, who went to a party the other night and he's kind of anti the Paso Robles wine scene thing because he's a snob, but he went and they were all there. All the, I like him. All the big players were there <laughs> and he came and he was going, okay, I'm going to go. And I'm like, we'll go because these people are actually cool. If you're private and you're dealing with a private dinner and there's no showing off going on, it's a, it's a very different scene. So he went and he came back the next day. His biggest observation was, Every wine that every winemaker brought there was from France, and it was not what we make here, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. If that's what people are taking, so what, what does that mean? Yeah, no. Uh, Where does that take us? The guys that are, are you know, some of the guys. I mean, there's some of the guys that are, are great, great winemakers, and there's some of the guys that just don't have a clue or just making wines for for mm -hmm. one man essentially, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we can agree on that, but. The creative ones that are out there, and you and I both know who they are, if they start moving, and they are starting to move in another direction, that's interesting. And as you were pointing earlier, young winemakers, you know, people that have been doing it for a few years, after a while, okay, so now I'm comfortable, with, I, I'm a successful guy, and I'm comfortable with what I'm doing, that's when perhaps they start moving to be a bit more dangerous and do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. He's talking to Chris Cherry, mm -hmm. which is a good example, and I don't know how you and Chris are, but he's, a, good. he's a good friend of mine. And, he's a great guy. And he was making wines, his early wines, and I was kind of, I'd chat to him, go, yeah, they're, they're okay, you know. But that, in fact, that day that I went with you tasting with Randall Graham, his wines intrigued me more than anyone else's, and we went to, to a lot of places, yours mm -hmm. included, mm -hmm. and, and also Tablas Creek. But what he was doing, I found most interesting out of anything that day, just because he was pushing some envelopes. Mm -hmm. And his guy brought it up to him and said, look, I, honestly, I think what you're doing now is actually really interesting, it's really mm -hmm. cool. And his reply was, yeah, I, I'm chasing my own tail instead of somebody else's now. Which was a really good way to put That's it. That's great to hear. And, and he's doing some cool stuff over there. I mean, some of it's really funky and he's got some issues, as we all do. Mm -hmm. But it's nice also to be able to go to a guy's cellar and, and taste some of the stuff that's not so good. Which I went to his cellar one time and he took it, strangely, his assistant Anthony was there and I walked in with, with a couple of other winemaker guys and he said, what do you want to taste? And I was like, I want to taste your worst barrel. And he found it really weird, but to me it's like, well, that's kind of interesting. Yeah? You and I always talked about I don't want to taste your that. super, super, right, really good Morvedro. I mean, I'm sure it's great. You and I always talked about that. You said to me a long time ago when we first met, you're like, let's put a group together of winemakers where Still we go around and this. deals with everybody. Let's deal with our crap. Let's deal with our issues and our really different. That's the interesting conversation to have. Instead of, at the time, it was a penis contest, you know? Right. So, um, I don't do well in those, really. <laughs> <laughs> really? You Hence, types. I don't have a yacht full of virgins. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd be willing to sell the yacht full of versions for uh, coming up with a way that we could really, you know, get to the winemaking, or not to the winemaking public, but to get to the wine buying public and turn them onto the funk, turn them onto the, the artistic stuff. And, you know, it goes, it's anything in the artistic game. I mean, look at how artists struggle to survive, you know, and how to, you know, a painter has to die to make any money. You know, how can you turn around and find your audience and have it there? You know, we're lucky enough that Justin Smith, you know, he's, Justin's made some great wines. You know, he's got a great vineyard he's working from. And it's huge for Paso that he made the number one wine in the world per the spectrum. It is. You know, it's good, it's good press for all of us. Talented guy. But great. it's like we don't want to be slaves to it. We just want to be allowed to do what we want to do. And the wine buying public is interesting. I had this conversation with my wife, Marcy, over lunch. We ordered a, a Vouvray with lunch and it was slightly off dry sick yeah and it was kind of a conversation of this is great but people that 
aren't really comfortable with their wine palate and knowledge, won't like it because it's slightly sweet, and the perception is a serious white wine is always dry. Yes. Yeah, the wrong wine sweet is not good, and it's, it's badly made, and it shouldn't be sweet. It should be bone dry. Mm -hmm. The right wine should be slightly sweet. Mm -hmm. It's the same with rosé. I, mm -hmm. I, do exactly. I don't do pink. I only do big reds and really dry whites. You're big, so okay, sweet. so you haven't figured out really what you like yet, is kind of what that is. Because a pink wine in the right place at the right time is the best choice. Picnics. A slightly, slightly sweet vouvre with my lunch today was the perfect thing. Mm -hmm. I love it. I mean, like oysters, everybody's always dry, 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 dry. I love throwing vouvre or um, some, some crazy Alsatians in the mix every once in a while, you know? Um, Gruner's, Gruner's. Some awesome. of my Shannon's gonna be slightly sweet, so you'll. I'm ready. Maybe a bit bring too it, sweet. Bring it. I, I, I do believe there might be some foie gras present at that moment. Well, it could be. <laughs> some torchon. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, I actually, um, through the madness of Don Hofer, am uh, intrigued. He and I are going to try to grow truffles this year in Paso Robles. You're not the first. I want to find out who else has done it and where they went wrong. Well, no one's gone wrong. You just got to wait a while. I want, that's what I hate about the wine business, man. It's one of these things, it's like you do all the shit and your kids are the ones that are gonna get it all because like by the time it's ready to go, we're gonna be dead. Yeah. Or at least not Have you pair. seen my kids? Yeah, you have seen my kids. <laughs> your kids are gonna that's rock, That's a thrilling man. process. Yeah, you yeah. raise them eclectic enough. I ran that over someone's fence today, like dad the, uh, in the cruiser. <laughs> well done. Yeah, I don't know what I am. Oh, like Turley. you never ran over Turley. anything. <laughs> I, I never ran over anything. <laughs> My record is clean and perfect. No, there is trouble trees planted country. in Paso. I know there's some on the old Pacenti property. Right. And I, I've been wanting to plant, I just haven't yet. I plant a lot of fruit trees and over. Well, you and I are supposed to be going to make tree. gin, and I'm sure that we need another co-patriot in crime with Mr. Hofer to go and wrestle his, uh, his truffle prospects into reality. So, truffle gin. Truffle a, gin there's a, there's a, there is a thought. <laughs> 